Quickly before we jump into today's video, I want to start off by saying thank you to everybody who has subscribed to this channel, as well as everybody who has liked, commented, and shared my past videos. To a lot of people, 900 subscribers isn't that crazy, but to me I find it really cool that there's 900 people out there who like the research I'm doing and are willing to keep up with the content that I'm producing. So thank you to everybody who subscribed and continue leaving your feedback in the comment section below because I'm always looking for ways to improve this channel to make it better for you guys, the viewers. So with that, let's jump into what we're going to be talking about today, which is a really clever protocol that was introduced in November of 2020 called KeeperDAO. Now, a lot of you have probably heard about KeeperDAO because it gained a lot of notoriety in the weeks and months after its launch. And Rook Token was actually one of the best performing altcoins of the early phases of this crypto bull cycle. We saw Rook Token consolidate after its launch for a few weeks around the $70 to $100 range, after which it went on a crazy run to around $800 a token. But since then, Rook Token has been underperforming the rest of the crypto market, and I've seen a lot of people pronounce the project as dead. So what I want to do in today's video is talk about what KeeperDAO is and the problem that it solves. We'll jump into the economics underlying the Rook Token, which can help us explain the recent underperformance. And then I'm going to jump into my short-term and long-term investment thesis regarding Rook Token. So with that, let's jump right in. Before I jump into the specifications of KeeperDAO that make it such a clever protocol and such an interesting economic experiment, I want to provide a broad overview of how KeeperDAO works and what it is, just so that we have a conceptual framework to start to build off of. So broadly speaking, KeeperDAO is an on-chain liquidity underwriter for DeFi. And KeeperDAO allows people to pool together their assets to passively earn profits from arbitrage, liquidations, or other yield generating opportunities within DeFi. Now, KeeperDAO is a two-sided network made up of keepers and liquidity providers. Liquidity providers pool their assets together to form pools of specific tokens, and they're rewarded with Rook tokens for committing their capital. Keepers are on-chain profit seekers who are then given access to these liquidity pools to take advantage of any arbitrage or liquidation opportunities that arise within the DeFi ecosystem. And keepers are also rewarded for their work with Rook tokens. The profits that are generated by keepers in their operations are then added to a treasury that is cumulatively owned by all Rook token holders. Now, as of today, KeeperDAO's treasury sits at a value of around $46 million. And on top of that, there's around $270 million worth of capital pooled on the protocol. And to understand how they've been able to grow the treasury so quickly and how they've been able to attract so much capital to be pooled on their platform, we have to take a look at the problem that KeeperDAO is solving. And the problem that they're solving is that the miners on the Ethereum network are able to extract almost all of the value from arbitrage or liquidation opportunities that arise on chain. And this value that they're able to extract is referred to as miner extractable value. Now there's two primary ways that miners are able to extract almost all of the value from these opportunities. The first way that they're able to do this is by reorganizing blocks, reordering transactions within blocks, and by front running or tailgating market participants. Now the way that they're able to do this is by using the data stored in mempools. And what mempools are, are essentially like waiting rooms for transactions that have been submitted to the network, but have yet to be added to a block. And what miners do with this data is they run complex models to determine what the optimal ordering of transactions would be so that they can extract maximal value from arbitrage or liquidation opportunities that arise within a given block. Now, the second way that they're able to extract almost all of the value from these transactions actually doesn't require miners to do any work at all. They just have to let profit seeking arbitrageurs battle it out over gas prices. So let's say that two profit-seeking arbitrageurs identify the same opportunity on the Ethereum network. In order to profit from that opportunity, an arbitrageur has to make sure that their transaction is listed before the opposing arbitrageur. And the way that they do this is by incentivizing miners to place their transaction first on a block by bidding up the price of gas. And what ends up happening because of this mechanism is that arbitrageurs bid up the price of gas to the point that that opportunity is no longer profitable or that the arbitrageurs are actually operating at a loss. And what ends up happening is that the miner takes home all of the value anyways because of the fact that they're the ones being paid that gas. And this not only creates a problem for arbitrageurs on the network, but it also creates problems for just everyday users of the Ethereum network because gas prices are pushed up to the point that it can cost anywhere from $50 to $100 to submit a transaction on the Ethereum network. So essentially the problem that's happening here is an efficiency problem caused by the misalignment of incentives of participants who are playing this uncoordinated profit-seeking game on the Ethereum network. Now, KeeperDAO has introduced a clever solution to this problem by creating three games that align the incentives of on-chain profit seekers, who I'm going to call keepers from now on, liquidity providers, as well as users of DeFi protocols. Now, if you've read a little bit about KeeperDAO, you'll know that they're a game theoretically optimized protocol. And essentially what they're referring to when they say this is that they're able to achieve Nash equilibrium among their participants. 
Now, the best example of Nash equilibrium is a classic prisoner's dilemma that we're all familiar with. Prisoners are faced with the option of either choosing a cooperation strategy or a defection strategy. And keepers are faced with essentially the exact same problem. They can either choose to cooperate one another to maximize profits, or they can defect and try to steal all the profits from arbitrage or liquidation opportunities and keep those profits for themselves. And what KeeperDAO aims to do is align the incentives of keepers to ensure that they cooperate with one another so that profits for keepers can be maximized. Now, I've also included an article in the description of this video for those of you who want to know why the cooperation strategy achieves Nash equilibrium among keepers. Now, the three games that KeeperDAO has introduced to achieve Nash equilibrium are the hiding game, the coordination game, and the incentive game. Now, before I get into how these games work, I want to briefly mention that I'm only going to be including the parts that are relevant to know for my investment thesis. If you want to get a more detailed explanation of how each of these games work, I've included a link in the description below to KeeperDAO's white paper that goes in depth about how each of these games work. All right, so the first game is the hiding game. And the hiding game was introduced to provide keepers with a way to avoid detection by miners on the Ethereum network when they're looking to extract profits from liquidation or arbitrage opportunities. And the way that KeeperDAO does this is by allowing users of DeFi protocols to route their orders through specialized smart contracts on KeeperDAO. Keepers are then given priority access to these transactions and they can extract profits from these opportunities as they see fit in accordance with the rules of the coordination game, which we'll get into shortly. The profits that are made from arbitrage or liquidation opportunities from the orders routed through these smart contracts is then added to the treasury that is cumulatively owned and controlled by Rook token holders. Now, a good question to ask would be why would DeFi users want to route their orders through these specialized smart contracts? And the reason why is because if a keeper is able to generate a profit from a user's order that is routed through the smart contracts, then part of the profit earned by that keeper is then returned to the user in the form of freshly minted Rook tokens. So in this sense, users of DeFi protocols are incentivized to route their orders through smart contracts on KeeperDAO because they aren't going to be exploited by miners on the Ethereum network and they stand to earn some of the profit made by that keeper in the form of Rook tokens. On top of that, profit-seeking arbitrageurs are incentivized to join the hiding game because of the fact that they're given priority access to these transactions and because they no longer have to compete in the uncoordinated game against miners on the Ethereum network, which is a losing game. But still, with just the hiding game, keepers on the KeeperDAO ecosystem might still be incentivized to compete with one another rather than to cooperate. And this is where the coordination game comes into play. The coordination game is the second of three games introduced by KeeperDAO. And the coordination game has three main goals, which KeeperDAO has called the laws of the coordination game. The three goals are as follows. One, the profitability of a keeper that is playing the coordination game must be higher than when that same keeper is not playing the coordination game. The sum profitability of all keepers playing the coordination game is higher than the sum profitability of the same keepers if they were not playing the coordination game. And three, the relative profitability between keepers playing the coordination game is the same as the relative profitability between the same keepers if they were not playing the coordination game. So essentially what these three laws are aiming to achieve is Nash equilibrium, where all of the participants in the game are incentivized to cooperate with one another because this is what leads to maximal profits for all keepers. And this is what the three goals are essentially aiming at doing. And these goals are achieved through scheduling rules as well as profit sharing rules. Now the scheduling rules refer to the process of deciding which keepers can act on a profitable opportunity first. Now I'll get into why this is important in a moment, but essentially the way that scheduling works is that each keeper must first create an identity and they create an identity by bonding a certain number of Rook tokens to their identity using a contract on KeeperDAO. New schedules are randomly created every 100 blocks. But the number of Rook tokens that a specific keeper has bonded to their identity increases the probability that they'll be placed at the top of that schedule. So that means that if you have the most Rook tokens bonded to your identity, you're not guaranteed to be ranked first in every single schedule, but you have a much higher probability to be ranked first than those who have very few Rook tokens bonded to their identity. Now, once these schedules are created, keepers act as they normally would. They look for profitable opportunities as they present themselves. The only difference that comes when scheduling rules are applied are that a keeper is not allowed to compete with the keeper that is ranked higher than them in the scheduling order. If a keeper does act out of order, then other keepers can employ a tit for tat strategy against that misbehaving keeper by acting out of turn when that keeper is above them in the scheduling order. And on top of that, if a keeper misbehaves enough times, keepers can vote to kick that keeper off of the keeper doubt ecosystem. So in this sense, the keepers are incentivized to follow the scheduling rules, which creates an environment where keepers are incentivized to cooperate with one another rather than to compete. 
Now the profit sharing rules are there to ensure that keepers who are following the scheduling rules are able to earn more profits by following those rules rather than defecting and acting out of turn. And the way that this works is that all the profits earned by keepers within a given day are distributed to all the keepers within the ecosystem. And the distribution of profits is proportional to the amount of rook tokens bonded to that specific keeper. But on top of this, if a certain keeper is underperforming other keepers and other keepers are outperforming other keepers, then underperforming keepers have their bonds slashed and the rook tokens taken from the underperforming keepers are given to the keepers that are outperforming. And what this ensures is that more rook tokens are slowly put in the hands of really effective keepers, which is good for the overall protocol because this means more profits will be generated by the network as a whole. So essentially what the coordination game aims to do is ensure that all keepers are willing to cooperate with one another because the outcome for all keepers by cooperating is better than if they were all competing against one another. Now this leads us into the third game, which is the incentive game. And I've already explained a lot of how the incentive game works. So this one's gonna be really brief. The incentive game is essentially structured around the use of rook tokens as an incentive for people to take part in the coordination game and the hiding game. Like I've already explained, users of DeFi protocols are incentivized to join the hiding game and route their orders using the smart contracts because they're rewarded with rook tokens. In addition to that, keepers are incentivized to join the hiding game and play in the coordination game because they're rewarded for it with rook tokens. But on top of that, liquidity providers are also incentivized to join the KeeperDAO ecosystem because they're rewarded for committing their capital with Rook tokens. And because KeeperDAO is a self-iterating protocol, the amount of rewards earned by liquidity providers or keepers or users of DeFi protocols can be changing and shifting all the time. So this is why you always want to keep an eye on the incentive structure of KeeperDAO if you plan on being a long-term holder or investor in KeeperDAO's governance token Rook. But essentially what the incentive game tries to do is to align the incentives of all the players that are playing the KeeperDAO games to make sure that they're cooperating and achieving the most optimal outcome. All right, so that is how the three games created by KeeperDAO work. And I hope I've done a good job of explaining at how those three games work together to align the incentives of participants to ensure that they cooperate with one another to extract the maximal amount of value out of any arbitrage or liquidation opportunities that arise within the DeFi ecosystem. Now it's time to take a look at the economics of Rook Token so that we can explain its recent underperformance and where it might be going in the future. Now we're going to start by taking a look at the supply side of Rook Token. The initial supply of Rook Tokens was set at 800,000 tokens. And in the first quarter, it was set to emit, or in other words, mint 200,000 more tokens. And each quarter after that is set to emit 70% of the amount of tokens that were emitted in the previous quarter. Now that 70% is called the decay rate. And the decay rate can be changed by Rook token holders through a vote. And this is one of the things that makes investing in the Rook token particularly challenging, which is that it's a self-iterating protocol, which can change the underlying investment thesis behind the Rook token pretty easily. And this makes it more challenging to build a short-term investment thesis on Rook token rather than a long-term investment thesis. Because the idea is that participants would have the long-term investment thesis in mind when they make governance decisions regarding the protocol. So to conclude on the supply side of Rook tokens, as the emission schedule stands today, the maximum amount of Rook tokens that are going to exist is going to max out just before 1.5 million tokens. So the inflation rate that Rook token holders are going to experience isn't that significant and it doesn't represent a very high hurdle rate for growth. So now what we have to do is jump into the demand function and take a look at what's going to be driving demand for Rook tokens and what's going to be driving the price appreciation for these tokens. And the reason why this demand function is of vital importance to the investment thesis regarding Rook tokens is because of the fact that Rook tokens are used as incentives to draw people into the games being played on the KeeperDAO ecosystem. But if people are given these incentives and have absolutely no reason to hold on to those Rook tokens, then as soon as those people are given those Rook tokens, they're just going to sell it on the market. So there has to be some economic utility to holding on to Rook tokens for the long term. And that's what we're going to take a look at now. So the way that I see it, the demand function for Rook tokens is two-sided. The first source of demand for Rook tokens is going to come from keepers because keepers are incentivized to bond more Rook tokens to their identity so that they can land higher in the scheduling iterations and therefore have a better chance at earning profits. But that doesn't generate economic utility for anybody outside of the keepers. So this isn't going to incentivize liquidity providers or users of DeFi protocols to hold on to the Rook tokens that they're given through incentive schemes. The main economic utility that I see for Rook tokens is the fact that Rook token holders cumulatively own and control the assets held in the treasury. Now, I think that because the value of Rook tokens are directly correlated to the funds held in the treasury, this can explain the recent underperformance of Rook tokens. Now, when Rook tokens peaked at a price of $800, there was around a million Rook tokens in circulation. And at that time, there was around $35 million of value held in the treasury. So this means that each Rook token was backed by around $35 of value when it was trading at $800 a token. That means that less than 5% of each Rook token was backed by true economic value. 
Now that Rook tokens have come back down to Earth, they're trading at around $300 a token. There's now 1.1 million Rook tokens in circulation, and there's around $46 million worth of value held in the treasury. This means that each Rook token is backed by around $41 of value, and with them trading at $300 a token, this means that just under 15% of each Rook token is backed by true economic value. So I think that what's happening here is that the market is telling us at which point Rook tokens become overvalued based on the amount of assets held in the treasury. Clearly, if Rook tokens are backed by less than 5% of value, then that's way too overvalued and the price of Rook tokens have to be adjusted. But now that each Rook token is backed by around 15% of value, we're starting to see the price consolidate, which tells us there's a little bit more demand in the market for Rook tokens. So now what we have is a range at which point we can reasonably argue that Rook tokens are overvalued or reasonably valued. So armed with this information that the market has given us, we can start to build out a short and long-term investment thesis. Now, I spent a little bit of time thinking about how the short and long-term investment theses would differ, but at the end of the day, they really are based on the same thing, which is the value of the treasury. Now, if you're investing in the short term, you're probably going to be more concerned with the assets held in the treasury appreciating in value. So if you're going to be investing in Rook tokens for the short term and are trying to capitalize on Rook token for this crypto bull market, what you should be bullish on is two things. The first thing being the price appreciation of the assets being held in the treasury. And right now, a strong majority of the assets held in Treasury are Ethereum, which isn't that surprising given that KeeperDAO is a protocol built on Ethereum. So if you're bullish on Ethereum, then buying some Rook is a good way to get exposure. But why would you want to buy Rook if you can just simply get exposure to Ethereum by buying Ethereum? Well, this is where the second reason comes into play, which is that in the short term, you're also going to be benefiting from the fact that Keepers are going to continue to add profits to that Treasury. So not only are you going to be benefiting from the price appreciation of the assets held in Treasury, but you're also going to benefit from the continued profits that are added to the Treasury. And on top of that, you can also make some extra capital gains from repricing. And what I mean by repricing is that let's say that the market decides that the price at which Rook should be trading is when 10% of the value of a Rook token is backed by assets held in the treasury rather than the 15% that it's at today. At that point, you're going to make capital gains just simply from the repricing of Rook tokens. So in the short term, why I'm bullish on Rook tokens is because I think that the assets held in treasury are going to continue to appreciate in value. And on top of that, I really love the incentive systems that KeeperDAO has created to ensure that keepers continue to generate profits and return them to the treasury. So not only do I think that the assets held in treasury are going to continue to rise in value, but I think that keepers are going to continue adding value to that treasury, which is why I think Rook tokens are going to perform better than the underlying assets held in the treasury. And on top of that, it's my belief that having 15% of the value of a Rook token backed by a true economic value in the treasury is more than enough. And in fact, I think that a reasonable price to pay for Rook tokens is when 10% of their value is backed by assets held in treasury. And the reason why is because if the governance decided to distribute those funds held in treasury as a dividend, then you'd be paid a 10% yield on your Rook tokens and still continue to own the Rook tokens that would accumulate future benefits from profits added to the treasury by keepers. And I think that a 10% dividend is more than enough to justify the risk being taken by investing in Rook tokens. Now this leads us into my long-term investment thesis, which is very similar to the short-term investment thesis, except it's a little bit less concerned about the price appreciation of assets held in treasury, and it's more concerned about seeing keepers generate more profits for the treasury. And the way that this would happen is that more users of DeFi protocols would route their systems through KeeperDAO, and more keepers would join the KeeperDAO ecosystem. And the reason why I think that this is going to happen is because of the clear advantages that users of DeFi protocols have to routing their orders through KeeperDAO, and also the clear advantages that keepers have to joining KeeperDAO. So I think that the increase of users routing their orders through KeeperDAO is going to increase the amount of opportunities available to keepers, which is also going to subsequently increase the amount of profits generated for the treasury. Now to finally wrap up, my strategy for investing in Rook tokens is essentially this. Anytime that Rook tokens are backed by more than 15% of value held in the treasury, I'm going to start buying Rook tokens slowly. And if at any point Rook tokens reach a price at which point less than 7% of their value is backed by assets in the treasury, I'm going to slowly start to shed my position. And this is essentially the band that I'm going to operate in. And my hopes are that it's going to maximize the profits that I'm able to make from trading and investing in Rook. So that does it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed and I look forward to seeing you all in my next video.